Hi everyone and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm your host Jessica King and I just wanted to quickly say thank you for joining us today. November is Diabetes Awareness Month and throughout the month of November, Kelsey Siebel Clinic in partnership with the American Diabetes Association and Lubies are working together to beat diabetes. This is the second of three webinars we will host this month focusing on preventing and managing diabetes. Today we'll discuss some of the new diabetic treatments we think you should know about. Today's speaker, endocrinologist Dr. Tom Thomas, will go over these new treatments and provide some more insight about them. Here's a little more info on today's speaker. Dr. Thomas is board certified by the American Board of Medical Specialties. He practices at four of our Kelsey Siebold locations, Clear Lake Clinic, Pasadena Clinic, the Pearland Clinic, and Meyerland Plaza. He is an endocrinologist who specializes in diabetes, osteoporosis, and thyroid management. And he has been with Kelsey Siebold since 2005, and that's just over 10 years. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and some fun facts about Dr. Thomas. In his free time, he jogs and plays tennis, as well as being active in his church community. Don't forget, we'll be taking any questions you may have at the end of the webinar. If one happens to pop up, just type it into your question box, and we'll do our best to address it at the end of the presentation. And now I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Thomas. Thanks, Jessica. So good afternoon to everybody. Um, good to join with everybody again. We did one of these webinars maybe three months ago approximately, and uh, it's good to be back talking about a whole different um, new set of treatment options we have in diabetes. So there, there's quite a bit of material we're going to be covering here, but we do have time for questions and answers towards the end of it. I just want to spend a few minutes, maybe five, six minutes, oh, with a brief overview of diabetes. Most of this, most everybody would knows, but so diabetes overall is an abnormality where insulin is unable to be broken down or insulin's inadequately produced. So the body either is not making adequate amounts of insulin and or not able to efficiently metabolize or break down insulin. So diabetes usually... The main two forms, type 1 diabetes is thought to be an autoimmune form of diabetes where the body tends to or the immune system tends to attack the pancreas and tends to prevent the production of adequate amounts of insulin. And so there's usually a significant amount of insulin deficiency in type 1 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, overall, there may be a small amount of insulin deficiency, but most of type 2 diabetes is due to resistance to insulin. The body still makes insulin but is not utilizing and, and, and using the insulin to convert into glucose and um, or convert into energy that the body needs for day-to-day -day activity for the brain, the heart, and the kidneys to function. So type 1 and type 2 diabetes are the main forms we'll be covering today. Overall, in this slide with the risk factors, the most common things are immediate family members. When I say immediate family members, overall, mother, father, brother, sisters, grandparents could be included in there, a family history of diabetes. But overall, with a family history of diabetes, typically, if you have family members that are well over 60 to 65 that develop diabetes late in life, I wouldn't really consider that a family history because it's very common to see diabetes late in life. But um, family members that have developed diabetes 30s, 40s, and 50s, yes, that would be significant as far as family history, as far as higher risk for an individual to develop diabetes early. Um, overweight or obese, just to define overweight, a body mass index well over 27, or a body mass index, which is obese, over 30. Body mass takes, in, body mass index takes body weight, um, and um, height into account as far as to gauge an individual's risk for um, medical problems. Next thing, sedentary lifestyle. That's probably a really important thing these days. Overall, the American Heart Association these days is recommending approximately 180 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. Now, that's quite a bit. If you look at that, that's about three hours a week. 180 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. Even if you can get 120 minutes of aerobic exercise in a week, it would actually be major as far as preventing cardiovascular risk, risks of high blood pressure, diabetes, and other things. 
and then um, high blood pressure is a risk factor as well as when it, when we're saying abnormal lipid levels, we're saying high triglycerides, which are dietary fats. Triglycerides well over 150 are considered to be high or HDL cholesterols that are low in women below 50 and in men um, below 40 would actually be considered um, low uh, HDL levels. The next slide is about warning signs. Typical symptoms of diabetes, and these symptoms usually accompany significant, um, significantly high blood sugars, typically well over 250 to 300 milligrams per deciliter blood sugars at the time. So typically excessive thirst and hunger, excessive urination, just really wore out and tired, unexplained weight loss is common. Uh, Numbness, tingling in the hands and feet typically occurs if the blood sugars have been high for usually um, months and years. Blurred vision usually accommodates rapid changes in blood sugar and then problems with healing. If you've been experiencing any of these kind of symptoms and they're new to you, um, definitely be a good idea to talk to your doctor about testing for diabetes. The next slide is a lot of information. It's the slide that's titled Non-Insulin Agents Available for Type 2 Diabetes. I'm not going to go over all of it. I'm going to target a few of the commonly used medicines first, and then we'll go from there. The third, the third row down, biguanides. Biguanides is the medicine very commonly used that most everyone's probably heard of called glucophage or metformin. Metformin is uh, still a tried and true first-line treatment for those that do tolerate it. And basically what metformin does is reduces the production of glucose by the liver. The liver tends to overproduce glucose and sugar in diabetes, and metformin blunts the production of glucose by the liver. And it also increases the rate of glucose uptake, meaning the muscles to take up and use insulin and use glucose in the muscle. Metformin helps the body do that and helps the body sensitize itself to the effects of insulin. Another class of medicines, overall four, uh, sorry, five rows down are this class, is this class called DPP-4 inhibitors. These are tablets and pills as well. Most commonly on the far, uh, towards the right side of the screen, the far right, there's a medicine called Genuvia you see there and on Gliza. These are commonly used pills, um, overall well-tolerated, overall safe. They're once daily, and they happen to enhance the body's production of insulin slightly when you're taking it, and they can be associated with some um, modest weight loss as well. So this class of medicines is commonly used and overall safe. I'm going to go to the next slide. The first class on the this slide with GLP-1 receptor agonists. This class of medicines has been out about 10 years now. They are injectable medicines that are taken either day, uh, daily or weekly. On the far right side of the screen, a medicine called Bieta. It's been around for quite a while, probably 10, 12 years now. And some newer agents like Victoza and Bidurion, which are... Um, daily and weekly, respectively, are also out. The advantage of this class of medicines is that not only do they increase the amount of insulin the body makes, but they can help with improving appetite, and as a result, improving body weight. They can be used with pills and actually combined with insulin therapy as well to reduce the amount of insulin an individual takes. Unfortunately, sometimes people can't tolerate this class of medicines. They get a bit of nausea and upset stomach with them, and some people just can't tolerate them. The second class down, the second row down, is this class, this SGLT2 inhibitor class, which is a very impressive class of diabetes treatments that came out recently. This class of medicines are tablets. They're pills taken once a day, most commonly of which is a medicine called Invokana, but um, also Farsiga and Jardiance that you'll see on the far right side of the screen are commonly used. The advantage of this class of medicines is that they enhance the spill of glucose into the urine. So they reduce blood sugar by increasing spill of sugar and glucose into the urine. A couple of important notes about this class, they may cause some significant dehydration because the, 
the higher the blood sugar, the more you'll urinate. So if the blood sugar is running average, you know, well over 220, 230, 240, you'll spill a lot of glucose in the urine and um, urinate quite a bit. And it could dehydrate an individual considerably. So we usually recommend at least four to five glasses of water a day when you're taking this class, class of medicines. And the medicines may also increase the risk for urinary tract infections and possibly groin rashes because you're spilling glucose into the urine. So just a couple of important notes and a couple of important warnings for this class of medicines. Uh, several patients do do very well with them. They may lose quite a bit of weight. They may um, come off of insulin therapy with them. They are very aggressive medicines and overall tolerated well. The next class down is an old class of medicines, the sulfonylureas, which are commonly amaryl, glyburide, glucotrol, glipizide are the commonly used treatments and medicines like this. And they increase the body's insulin release, not production, but increase the body's release. They may end up causing a lot of low blood sugar reactions. That's unfortunately the highest risk of these medicines. We do want to try to minimize the use of this class of medicines in our older patients, especially over the age of 60. Moving down, I'm going to move over about three slides past the blue man. Um, if you wanted to take a quick look at the blue man, it's it's talking about the effects of this GLP-1 class of medicines, the Baeta and the Victoza and the Bidurion. Uh, really talks a little bit about how they work, about promoting satiety and reducing appetite and also reducing the amount of production of uh, glucose by the liver. They work very effectively at reducing um, emptying of the stomach as well and increasing the amount of insulin that the body makes. Moving on from the non-insulin treatment options to some of the insulins out there, and a lot of the new treatment options that have come out in the last approximately two months, very recently, are in the arena of insulin therapy. Now, insulin therapy is used in both type 1s and type 2s. In type 1s, it's used to supplement what the body, well, to replace what the body doesn't make. In type 2s, it's actually used to supplement the amount of resistance the individual has to try to overcome the resistance to insulin an individual has. The older treatment options with insulin, overall, the insulins are broken up into two classes of insulins. One are what they call basal insulins that are long-acting insulins that provide the need of insulin over night and into the morning. And the other class of medicines or insulins are called prandial insulins. Prandial meaning meal-acting insulins. Prandial basically means how the um, how the how insulin production and how insulin affects the meal time, um, the meal's effects on our blood sugar. So NPH. NPH is a very old insulin. It lasts 12 hours. It's taken twice a day. It's been around for a long time. And just a quick note, NPH is over the counter. Over the, it doesn't necessarily need a prescription. So if an individual can't get insulin covered on their formulary or with insurance, NPH can actually be purchased over the counter at Walmart. For a, a, and it's, it's inexpensive. Glargine is an insulin called Lantus. It's commonly known as Lantus. Glargine is the chemical name. Lantus is usually a once daily insulin, but at very low doses, it's used twice a day and very high doses, meaning over 60, 60 units a day, it's usually split in those patients as well. The advantage of using Glargine or Lantus over NPH is that it has a lot less swings over the day. So you're not dealing with as much low blood sugars overnight as you would be with NPH typically. Detamir is an insulin called Levamir. Levamir has been out for at least eight years now. Levamir, Detamir is similar to uh, Lantus, but it's typically dosed twice a day. It's a little weaker. It's about 20% weaker than Glargine or Lantus, but it's also a basal insulin. I'm going to skip over this U500 insulin. It's a rarely used insulin and a very potent insulin. I won't spend too much time on that one. But we'll go down to the prandial insulins, the insulins that work at mealtime. 
regular insulin has been out the longest. Regular insulin is taken half an hour before the meal. It lasts approximately four hours or so, but it can last up to eight hours, but usually about four hours. And it basically blunts the glucose spike after a meal, and it's usually used in addition to NPH or glargine above. The other ones, other insulins you're seeing on the bottom, Aspart, which is Novolog, Glulysine, which is Apidra, Lispro, which is Humalog, and this inhaled insulin we'll talk about later. These are fast-acting insulins. They're not human insulins. They're what they call recombinant insulins. They're made in the lab. They're not made with their overall um, not human proteins. And um, so Aspart, Apidra, and Humalog are fast-acting insulins. They can be taken closer to the meal right before you eat, and they tend to not have as much risk for low blood sugars after meals as regular insulin would. But these are usually taken in addition to long-acting insulins like Largine, and Detimer. The next slide basically just shows you the branded names of these insulins. Lantus is Glargine, Levomir is Detimer, Humalog is Lispro, Novolog is Aspart, Apidra is Glulysine. Lantus and Levomir on the top are the two long-acting insulins we talked about. Humalog, Novolog, and Apidra are the fast-acting insulins before meals. Briefly going over some of the new treatment options. This is a major thing because we really haven't had a lot of new treatment options with insulin for at least eight years now. Most of the new treatment options are with stronger insulins. We are noticing these days that a lot of our patients are requiring considerable amounts of insulin per day to manage things, and a lot of times the, the old, older insulins are not potent enough. Now, this, medicine, this new insulin called Tugeo is a form of Glargine, or Lantus, but it's a potent form of Lantus, which is three times as strong as Lantus. The usual insulins that we spoke, to, so what, spoke about earlier, their concentration, or their strength, is about 100 units per cc. So you get about 100 units per cc of liquid in a, in a, in a syringe or needle. This one is actually 300 units per cc. It's a long-acting insulin. It comes in a pen. You would dial the normal dose of glargine that you would be taking previously. The, the pen would convert that dose to one-third less, and it would only administer one-third less the amount of insulin. So Tugeo or glargine, U300 is one of the main ones. A brand new one that's come out in the past two weeks it was approved is an insulin called uh, Traceba. The brand name is called Traceba. The other chemical name is called Degladec. The reason why this has come out is that Lantus and Levomir in lots of patients have had to be used twice a day. So they've thought to not really be once daily insulins. This Degladec lasts a bit longer and it's truly thought to be a, a long-acting insulin that should be taken once a day. So this may actually be a very good option for patients that really want to stick with the once daily insulin with the long acting insulin. And it's, um, these insulins are all taken by subcutaneous or intra fat um, injections. The next insulin option is a fast acting insulin called Humalog. We talked about Humalog earlier. Um, Lispro was the other name for it. This is a stronger form of Humalog. It's uh, U200. So it's twice as potent as regular Humalog. This one comes in a pen only right now. It's called Humalog U200. It's in a little quick pen. Just like Humalog, it comes in a pen. And um, like I was saying, it, it holds double the amount. Well, it's double as potent as the previous Humalog. So typically, if patients are requiring usually over 30 units per meal with Humalog, and it's still not covering them and taking care of them and managing their after-meal blood sugar, this U200 may actually be a very good option. To close up with the new treatment options is an inhaled insulin called Afriza. Afriza came out approximately six, seven months ago. It is approved for the treatment of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. This is important to understand that this is an, 
a rapid acting insulin. So this is really only a meal acting insulin that should be used along with a long acting insulin, especially in type ones that use it, it should be used with long acting insulins. In most type twos that are on insulin, a freezer would be added on to a long acting insulin. But this is an inhaled insulin. Couple of warnings about it. Folks that may have asthma or chronic lung disease or emphysema really should not be using a freezer. It may make the breathing worse. Lung function tests should be done, pulmonary function tests should be done prior to starting a Frieza and about every six months to monitor the lung, um, lung's ability to tolerate this inhaled insulin. But it's a very good um, option for patients that um, don't have lung disease that are um, really hesitant to use injections with insulin. So we'll move on to questions. I see that we have about 64 people that have joined with us. Uh, I can try to address the questions that we have. We have approximately 10, 10 minutes to uh, address the questions. I actually kind of want to start us off sure. on a question. Sure. So I know we talked about a couple different options to use insulin, like with a needle or with a quick pen. What are your thoughts about using the pump? All right, so Jessica um, is um, inquiring about the use of an insulin pump. And so an insulin pump is, is a good option, and usually the option is a very positive option for folks that have very volatile blood sugars on insulin therapy. Typically, a pump is a good option if someone has been through multiple daily injections of insulin with long-acting and short-acting insulins, and uh, they're still having a very hard time with bouncing around maybe 200-point ups and downs over the day, and, and it's just not able to be managed and stabilized. Insulin pumps are a very good option to stabilize blood sugars because they can be adjusted hourly to be able to shut off the flow of insulin immediately and to use different rates of insulin per hour to stabilize blood sugars over the day. We use pumps quite a bit. It used to be we only used them in type 1 diabetics, but in the last six, seven years, we've commonly used them in type 2s. Insulin pumps are a very good option, and they're actually covered pretty well these days on insurance plans. So let me look at some of the questions we have from our audience. Um, one of the questions is, there's a question, recently I've heard that medical doctors advise that over a certain age, there are negative consequences from diabetes medications. It's actually a very good question. And um, it is true that certain medicines, for example, uh, as we get older, are the rate at which our kidney clears toxins and nutrients tends to be lower and lower over time in general. And so a lot of the medicines that are cleared through the kidney, for example, metformin, metformin or glucophage, it would be usually a good idea to start weaning it back or cutting back the dose of metformin over time if doctors are noticing that the rate at which the kidney is filtering is not doing as well. And so metformin in the setting of, of patients that are noticing lower and lower kidney function should be weaned off and maybe taken off with a lot of patients. The second class of medicines that you have to be concerned about in patients that are older, typically 60 to 65 or older, would be this class of medicines with glipizide, gliburide, or glucotrol. Particularly gliburide. Gliburide may have a much higher risk of dropping blood sugars very severely low um, when patients get older. That's particularly because an individual's ability to react to a low blood sugar or know that their blood sugars are low may not be as obvious as they go to older because the body stress response mechanism gets a little bit um, mitigated as you get older. Not only that, as the kidney function may drop over the years, um, these medicines like gliburide and uh, glimepiride tend to increase their blood levels and the body's not able to clear the medicine. So those that class of medicines may need to be minimized as well when patients age. So another question is, what is Humulin? Humulin 7030. So 7030 along with 7525. So Humulin 7030, there's a, a couple of other branded insulins like Novolog Mix 7030 and Humalog Mix 7525. These are 
pre-mixed insulins that have a certain percentage of long-acting insulin and another a certain percentage of short-acting insulin mixed into one insulin. They're usually taken twice a day before breakfast and supper. Humalin 7030 is 70% long-acting insulin and 30% short-acting insulin. It's usually a long-acting insulin called NPH and 30% of a short-acting insulin called regular insulin. So that's overall what Humalin 7030 is. The Another question is, if on a Frieza, which is the new inhaled insulin at meals, uh, will individuals need to inject for the long-acting insulin? Overall, yes, that's correct. With a Frieza, which is a fast-acting insulin at meals, it typically won't last long enough to work overnight into the mornings, and so typically you'd have to use a long-acting insulin like Lantus or Levomir or NPH overnight. A very good question, actually. I'm seeing how far from the skin surface is the stomach? Um, how What would result if insulin needle penetrated the stomach wall? Good, good question. So overall, the thought in the past, in the past, which is not the thought now, was that you would need larger needles for heavier heavier individuals. The truth of the matter is that the there's been a lot of studies in that area. We actually really only need five millimeter, maybe even up to six millimeter needles for insulin injections in most everybody. There is very minimal distance between the fat under the stomach and the skin on the outside of the stomach. There's about a centimeter or two difference between the fat of the stomach and the outside skin. So really, sorry, it's actually millimeters difference between the fat of the stomach and the skin of the outside uh, abdominal wall. So it really is not much difference. You can use tiny needles in most everybody to access insulin into the system. It just needs to access belly fat under the abdomen. Uh, let's see, the next question. Excellent question. There's a question about which medications and insulin are recommended for gestational diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy. As far as insulins go, the, I'll just say what are the recommended insulins in pregnancy. Overall, Levomir and Novolog are overall the, the insulins that have most been studies, studied and most recommended during pregnancy. I will tell you Humalog has thought to be safe. Lantus has been thought to be safe in pregnancy. But the recommended insulins are actually Levomir and Novolog in pregnancy. Um, metformin therapy overall has thought to be safe within the first trimester of a pregnancy. Uh, the sulfonylureas like glucotrol and glimepiride, there's mixed studies on it overall not recommended in pregnancy. And the other oral and injectable medicines are, are contraindicated or should not be used in pregnancy. So there's a question about um, does metformin teach the body it doesn't need to process insulin such that using metformin might mean the body can't be as easily cured through increased exercise, weight loss, and of course diet and control. I really don't think that would be accurate. Um, metformin actually works with the system, works with the liver and the pancreas to reduce the amount of glucose made by the liver, and it works with the body to be able to sensitize the body via the muscle to not have to use as much insulin. It doesn't really trick the body into thinking that you don't need as much insulin. It works with the system to be able to sensitize the body to insulin and help the liver to reduce the amount of glucose it needs or need it makes. We are coming towards the end of our time. It's 12.30. There are a lot of other questions in regard to um, a lot of associated treatments with diabetes that we may not be able to address right now. I'm For now, I'm going to turn um, our presentation back to Jessica, who's going to go over some um, final comments. I really appreciate everyone that's been able to join us. This is a pretty good turnout for a midday um, webinar. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to talk in the near future with everybody. Thank you. I see one question that I want to address while um, I have the microphone here. Um, 
It's about getting a hold of the presentation. Uh, just so everyone knows, we record our presentations and post them to YouTube. And since you registered for this particular presentation, you'll be getting a link to that page whenever it's uploaded. So you can go back and revisit it. Also, we're going to post them to our Kelsey Beats Diabetes uh, webpage in a PDF form so you can flip through it if you want to do that. Um, and so you just received a better understanding of some of the new diabetic treatments available, and we hope that information was helpful to you. Uh, so this is going to conclude our webinar. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to you, Dr. Thomas, for doing such a great job. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Like Dr. Thomas said, it's a great turnout for a midday presentation. Uh, don't forget that Kelsey, don't forget to go to KelseyBeatsDiabetes.com for more info about our month-long campaign and also to register for our last webinar. It's going to be next Wednesday, uh, Eat This, Not That, Dining Out with Diabetes, by, presented by uh, dietitian Rhonda Elsenbrook. And also during the month of November, dine at any participating Luby's restaurants in the greater Houston area and try one of their featured healthier menu options. And consider making a donation to support diabetes research and programs. Don't forget to follow us on social media and join in on the conversation. Um, and just a quick tidbit, the ADA walk is next Saturday, November 21st. So if you wanted to sign up, you can walk with Team Kelsey as we participate in that. And that info is on our community page. It's community.kelsey-siebel.com. Uh, thanks again for listening, and I'll talk to you all next week.